Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Making Fun. Thank you for joining us. On today's adventure, we are going to be time traveling back to Victorian England and visiting 221B Baker Street. <laughs> for the housing for our lovely mini Baker Street, I have selected this old jewelry box that I got at Goodwill for about $6 and is very reminiscent of all of the old jewelry boxes that I used to have as a child. I drew out my space and then drew a little version of what I was going for so that Tavis and I were on the same page. And then I started taking apart the whole thing. I first took out the glass windows because I knew I was going to break them and also that we weren't gonna use them. I took out the little chandelier necklace holders, but I have definitely kept in order to uh, probably be a chandelier at some point for another build. I don't have any plans, but it's probably gonna happen. And then I took all of the inside beige, kind of gross fake velvet lining out of it, uh, which took no time to pull out, but I had to spend then hours of my life scraping out because of the glue that they use. And also those are all of the spots that were gonna be left wood. So yeah, fun times. My main job was the background and what Baker Street wouldn't have bookshelves. So Tavis came up with this really cool idea for making the bookshelves, which was basically taking a piece of cheap dollar store foam board and carving in a 2D image of a bookshelf as you would just draw it flat and then removing the negative space. So the space is between and above the books, pulling all that extra foam out and then making sure that there was a good indent between each books and kind of rounded off to give you that round spine vibe. And that was really it. It was super easy and super smart of Tavis. I was making shelves out of popsicle sticks. I would have had to have made each book separately. It would have sucked. Tavis is smarter than me. Noted. Then I painted everything brown because it brown was a good base color. It's the color of the shelves. And then I used a black wash to start building up the illusion of depth because when you're making a mini box, you don't have a lot of space to work with. We only had about four inches of depth to work with in all of this, and most of that was gonna be taken up by the chairs. So yeah, we had to create that illusion with shadows. Off camera, I carved a little fireplace front and put a mantle on top of it, and then I checked with my bookshelves on this piece of foam board that was cut to size to make sure that it was all going to fit nicely next to each other the way I had planned for it. Uh, once I knew that my fireplace was good, I then used this ball stylus to round out the pillars on the columns, and I set everything with Mod Podge in the hopes that the foam wouldn't re-expand, which it wouldn't have done anyway, so I don't know why I did that. Uh, then I made a hearth by cutting a piece about the size of the mantle and cutting some stones into it because I realized that you can't just put a fireplace down on top of a wooden floor because that's a bad idea. And then I painted the whole thing white because I wanted the fireplace to be white and in many of the source videos that I looked at, the fireplace was white. I painted all the books off camera yet again. Tavis and I were trading the camera a lot for this. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I am using a very, very small flathead screwdriver to put all of the gold embellishments on the book spines. Then here we go again with the black wash. If you're wondering how to make black wash to create shadows, it is a lot of water, a little bit of black paint and a drop of dish soap to help it get into all the cracks. I covered everything in this black wash, and then I used a cotton swab to remove a lot of the extra black wash from the actual spines of the book so they didn't get darkened too much, but the spaces in between the books got darkened to give the illusion of shadow. I also did some black wash on the hearth and on the columns around the fireplace because even the cleanest fireplace is still gonna have soot on it, and I know Mrs. Hudson is fastidious, but I'm sure that the fireplace isn't going to be perfect all of the time. So I put a little soot on it. So for my contribution to this, I got to make the chairs. Now this is something that I've always really wanted to do. There's something about working on the small scale of dollhouse furniture that it's a different kind of focus than uh, you're doing a bigger project. There's a delicacy. 
I feel like a grown man who uh, makes doll furniture is either the kind of person that you go to for deep spiritual advice about your life, or you really want to stay as far away from as possible. So this was a really fun opportunity for me to slow down and work meticulously on something that's very small, which is a fantastic contrast to what I had just done, which is uh, my most recent build making the tennis ball launcher. So to begin, I downloaded and printed out the template in cardstock. I decided that rather than just making the two, I began with a prototype. Once I got the system down, I decided that I wanted to make four of these chairs. So I traced out each piece onto the wood and then used the scroll saw to carefully cut them out. And then sanded them down. Some of the pieces needed to be glued together to make them double the thickness. Using a pencil, I then traced all the pieces onto the back side of my fabric, making sure to leave plenty of space around the edges because I still needed to glue and fold the pieces down. Now I'm using the power drill to drill out holes in the back of the chair. After I add the batting and the fabric, I can sew what then looks like buttons into the back of the chair, giving it that pillowing effect. Using a little bit of batting and then covering that batting up with the fabric that I had previously drawn out, I could then fold that piece over on the back and glue it down. This is the first time that I've used tacky glue and I was really impressed with its stickiness. It, it doesn't work quickly, but once it bonds, it bonds really strong. Whenever I had two pieces that were butting up against each other at a 90 degree angle, I always tried to pop out that piece. The tacky glue did a really good job of keeping the fabric in place when I come in and cut off that piece that's jetting out. Trying to bend the fabric around a curved piece of wood was challenging because it would bunch up. So to prevent that, I put some slices in the fabric so when I pulled tightly, the fabric was snug around the curve. Now I'm gluing my cardstock down to the fabric, but what I realized is that there is actually a direction to this fabric, that the diamond shape is a little bit taller in one direction, and I wanted to make sure that all my pieces were consistent. So I had to tear all my pieces off and re-glue them back down facing the proper direction for the cardstock. This is one of those things that no one would have noticed at all, except for me, but I had to do it. Now each piece of the cardstock also needed to be glued and folded over so that there's a nice seam along the edge of the pieces of cardstock. And here we have all four chair parts laid out. Behold, isn't it glorious? Doesn't it fill you with majesty? Now the fun part where I got to actually assemble all the pieces together. So I did try using tacky glue to glue the pieces together and it just did not hold the chair together long enough. I would have had to have clamped it or held it in place. So I did end up going back and doing this mostly with hot glue, which was really hard because I had to be careful that none of the hot glue was seen on those seams. But the nice thing about working with hot glue is that it dries so quickly. So here I take a broken piece of toothpick and roll it up inside of the batting. Now this is going to make the pillow part for the arms of the chair. Putting a little bit of tacky glue down on the arm of the chair on both sides and then 
gluing the cotton roll down to the chair. Now this looks really big and puffy, but when I come in and cover it with the fabric, it's gonna hold a lot of that puffiness down. Now to cover up that seam that is exposed on the outside of the chair, I then glue down the cardstock that I covered with the fabric, and that hides all of that overlap on the outside of the wood piece that I covered with batting and fabric. Now this little tiny piece goes over the front of the chair. Part of this build required that we make cordage. Now the way that we made cordage is we applied a little bit of tacky glue to the fabric and laid down a piece of embroidery floss on top of that glue. Then fold the fabric around the embroidery floss. After the glue dries, you can come in with a pair of scissors and cut back the cord. You have a nice piece of cord that is made from the same fabric that the rest of the chair is made from. Now I apply a bead of tacky glue to the seam between two pieces. And then I can come in with the cordage that we just made and fill that seam up. And it really holds the whole thing together visually. This is one of those steps that I very easily could have not done and no one really would have ever noticed except for me. And I'm glad I did it because in the end it just gives the, the resulting product a, a level of depth that I don't think it would have had. I think that it makes it look more like a real chair in the final shots than if uh, it didn't have this and everybody would be able to see the gap. It just makes it look a little bit more realistic. It's worth the time. Then I got to come in with the Dremel and make the legs. Now this was really fun trying to make that claw foot look very specific aesthetic that I wanted to make sure that I harnessed as much as possible. So I got to come in with the Dremel and using some just cheap basswood that I picked up at Michael's, got to sit there and carve out, what is it, 20 legs? Again, this is a very delicate process and it was really nice having this clamp to, to help me. I should have clamped the clamp to the table. Using a pin vise, I drilled holes in the bottom of the chair so I could attach the legs. Now, originally, I did try to do this with my power drill, which was just too much. It was too much power, too much force. The pin vise was just perfect. I needed a rug, and in order to make a tiny rug, one must make a tiny loom. I first learned how to make looms, I think in third grade or something, and it was a, a weird task I always enjoyed. 
So when I had the opportunity to make a loom and weave my own rug, I thought it was the most sensible possible way to do this instead of just using a piece of fabric like any normal person would. I wove a rug out of embroidery floss. And this was actually probably the fastest part of the project. It took me the least amount of time. When I do it again, I will probably think about a pattern more. I just kind of made a beige rug with red tassels. Um, that was all I would planned for for this because this project had so many elements. I didn't know how I was gonna juggle all of them. So a lot of things I did the easy way just in case something else got super hard. Um, I did some Mod Podge on the back and uh, there's your rug. I decided to do an homage to Jeremy Brett Sherlock and so the picture over the fireplace is of the Reichenbach Falls. The frame is made out of toothpicks and I just glued them down right to the frame, cut them to size, used an X-Acto knife to kind of true everything up a little bit and then I painted it all black. It was a really easy thing to do. Um, it did not look good for a long time until it was all painted black and then it looked good. So I would recommend this method but you have to have a little bit of faith in it. There's a lot of objects in this. Sherlock was known for being a little bit cluttered and scattered. And there are some very well-known objects that are in Sherlock Holmes and appear in many of the versions, such as the knife through the mantle that holds the mail down. And that was what I was doing here. It is actually written as a jackknife and I forgot that. So it's not, it's a dagger in this version. Um, and then I made a little skull. My first attempt was kind of lumpy. But after a little bit of finesse, I was able to figure it out. I actually am very familiar with the human skull, having one myself. So it didn't take me long to get the shapes quite right. And I had to redo the face again because the first face looked like an alien. And uh, that's not what we wanted. I was going for a realism here. It's pretty much to scale. I never like made anything, everything exactly to scale. I just spent a lot of time comparing things with the chairs, with the background, with the bookshelves to kind of get an idea of scale. I made a lot of things out of clay for this, but unfortunately a lot of that video got lost. We have some uh, SD card issues, as any uh, filmmaker will know. So some of the coolest things I actually made for this you aren't gonna be able to see until the final shots, which is a bummer for you, but it's also kind of a fun reveal for me. So there you go. Uh, here, this blob is actually a human torso, a very tiny human torso, as in one would even go as far as to call it a bust. It looks like one of those, right now it looks like one of those ghost busts from the Haunted Mansion. Uh, what it is actually going to be is a bust of Napoleon. Once again, one of those, if you know, then you know. I don't believe the busts of Napoleon ever actually had a place in Baker Street, but it seemed like a fun little nod to one of his more famous cases. Um, and also, I didn't think I was actually going to make this work, and I was pretty sure that this was going to be garbage that I would throw away, but it turned out really well. So there's a lesson for you, kids. Uh, just try, because the thing you think that is going to look the worst might end up looking the best. Lastly, I wanted to make the gas lights that would have been over the fireplace. I used this cheap holiday LED lights that have one of those little battery packs. And uh, I wound about three of those little lights together and then just stuck them inside of the little glass vial that I got from the craft store and then wrapped them in wire to hold them still but also so that I could give it a nice uh, sconce shape coming from the wall. There I am bending it. Yes, my nail polish has come off by this point in the video uh, and I made two of those. For the fireplace, 
I didn't want it to be like a full flame fireplace. I wanted it to look like glowing embers in the coals. So what I did was I got my tissue paper out and I painted it with layers and layers and layers of red acrylic paint. And then I squished it all up like you do with tissue paper and then I unsquished it and I dry brushed it black. We did keep the mirror in the back there and you can see me painting the little bit in the fireplace black. It allows for a certain amount of reflection from the fire, but not too much. And then I Mod Podged my coals in place and after two, with just two layers, I start, I made so much of this, but all it took was two thin layers of tissue paper for it to look really amazing. And that was it for all the footage that didn't get lost. More footage got lost, but uh, you'll see it in the reveal. So uh, enjoy. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out our website at making check out our website at makingfunshop.com. You can also follow our Instagram at make.your.own.fun. Um